the archetype of the child revisited. In his essay, The Child Archetype, written in 1940, Jung made a number of statements which are still of the greatest relevance to some of our most modern ideas on the nature of the mind and on analytic practice. My talk tonight will attempt to encompass not only something about the child archetype as Jung wrote about it in that essay, that is, as a part of the adult psyche, uh, but I also hope to comment on the unconscious psychology of children since it will be borne in mind that the unconscious parts of the mind that Jung wrote about as being deeply influential in the life of the individual have their origins in the original constitution of the individual. The effects of these can be observed in infancy and childhood as you will see later on. So I will be speaking about a relation between the archetype of the child within the adult psyche as Jung described it and the unconscious mental life of the child himself. Now, Jung, as many of you know, was never especially given to constructing theories of infant and child development. It took one of his followers, whom you met last week, Michael Fordham, now working in this area for over half a century, to apply the body of Jung's work to infancy and childhood in a way that reconciled Jung's deeply philosophical approach to the mind with the empirical findings of analytical work with children and with observational studies of infants and children. Fordham's clinical experience and his findings in long-term infant observation tended to highlight what ought to have been evident in the analytic world in general, but was not prior to the seminal work of Melanie Klein and her followers. These findings were, one, that babies have a highly developed capacity for mental functioning right from the start, Two, that babies and children are largely concerned with conflicts around the body, their own body, and the bodies of their mothers and fathers, and have highly evolved defensive systems for managing those conflicts one way or another. And three, their development as individuals probably commences even before birth and is highly dependent on to what extent these conflicts and defenses promote or interfere with mental, emotional, and ethical maturation. One might say that Fordham facilitated for Jungians the understanding of the infantile psyche by helping to bring in a most convincing and meaningful way the opposite poles of the spiritual and the physical into relation in the fundamental area of infancy and childhood development. A word of reminder about archetypes may be in order at this point. Quoting Fordham himself, the general theory of archetypes was introduced, that is by Jung, to account for the regularities observed in the dreams and imagination of adult persons. They were not only experienced as important by individuals, but were reflected in the social organism and in religion, and so are an essential component of group psychology. The regularities, therefore, showed a general and probably universal distribution. These massive and convincing observations could not be transferred to the body imagery of infancy and early childhood to which it was hoped to apply the theory. And so it became necessary to use the more abstract parts of Jung's thesis as a means of orientation. By conceiving archetypes as dynamic structures closely related to, dr related to drives, expressed in impulses originating in neurophysiological and biochemical changes, the theory of archetypes brings body and psyche together and makes Jung's thesis as to their bipolarity particularly meaningful. The archetypes are unconscious entities having two poles, the one expressing itself in instinctual impulses and drives, the other in spiritual forms. In contrast to the instinctual drives, which are relatively fixed and few in number, the spiritual component has wide and flexible application. Transferring this idea, this is continuing with Fordham's quote, transferring this idea to childhood and starting from the spiritual components, the theory of archetypes means that a predisposition exists in the child to develop archaic ideas, feelings, and fantasies without their being implanted in him or without his interjecting them. <clears throat> 
It is because of the interaction between inner and outer experience that the archetypal image is to be distinguished from the archetype itself. The image is a psychical structure made from the interaction between the unconscious archetype and environmental or perceptual components and built into the ego and the inner world through projection, introjection, and identification. Though children become interested in metaphysics and arrive at highly pertinent conclusions based on the use of logical process and on archetypal imagery, yet the primary concern of infants is first with their bodies, what they experience of them, and what they can do with them. If, therefore, we are going to trace back into infancy the earliest manifestation of archetypes, and that is necessary in child analysis, it will be desirable to study how the archetype is reflected in early physical object relationships. That's the end of quote. In an important little paper, The Experience of the Skin in Early Object Relations, Esther Bick, a Kleinian, wrote that for the baby, parts of the personality are not differentiated from parts of the body. This statement highlights a juxtaposition reminiscent of the conception of the archetype as having two poles, the spiritual and the physical. To go back to the title of my talk and to Jung's essay, I want to refer to some of the ideas which Jung had which I feel are particularly fresh despite the time that has elapsed since he wrote and the great, even sweeping changes over the past 50 years in many aspects of the way we think about our patients and in the way we practice. Then I want to use those, I those ideas as a springboard to go on to talk a little about babies and children as they have been observed through the practice of infant mother observation, which I shall describe later, in the course of the vast amount of neonatal research that has gone on in recent years, and as we encounter them in the consulting room in people of all ages. Perhaps then I shall be able to link back again with Jung's concept of the child archetype as he developed it in 1940, having injected it with some thoughts about the archetypes of the child himself and their relevance to the psychological life of adults. Uh, I shall bring in another long quotation from the child archetype paper of Jung's in which, whether defensively or not, he exhorts us to avoid putting too much flesh on the bones of any archetype. In other words, to avoid doing just what I'm doing in this talk tonight. Quotes. Now, I'm aware that a psychological commentary on the child archetype without detailed documentation must remain a mere sketch. But since this is virgin territory for the psychologist, my main endeavor has been to stake out the possible extent of the problems raised by our archetype and to describe, at least cursorily, its different aspects. Clear-cut distinctions and strict formulations are quite impossible in this field, seeing that a kind of fluid interpretation belongs to the very nature of all archetypes. They can only be roughly circumscribed at best. Their living meaning comes out more from their presentation as a whole than from a single formulation. Every attempt to focus them more sharply is immediately punished by the intangible core of meaning losing its luminosity. No archetype can ever be reduced to a single formula. It is a vessel which we can never empty and never fill. It has a potential existence only, and when it takes shape in matter, it is no longer what it was. It persists through the ages and requires interpreting ever anew. In connection with unconscious life, Jung wrote that it is impossible to say what unconscious content contents refer to. Quotes, every interpretation remains an as if. The ultimate core of meaning may be circumscribed but not described. This, incidentally, is a view firmly held by the distinguished analyst Wilfred Bion, who, in my view, echoed some of Jung's most important philosophy. And it is now widely felt by Kleinian analysts who have themselves contributed to our own knowledge and theories of the mind, that a dialogue with the patient which evokes and deepens unconscious imagery, that is to say, which opens rather than closes one's thinking, is far preferable to the practice by the analyst of proffering deep interpretations 
and thus implying, not without a little assumption of omniscience on the part of the analyst, that there is but one truth. Jung's admonitions, then, are not too modest by today's standards, for we are becoming more and more aware of our limitations in understanding any human being, whether oneself or another. Yet to Jung, even the circumscribing of archetypal, primitive, or infantile aspects of the psyche is an essential step forward in our knowledge of ourselves. He cites childhood dreams and fantasies as manifestations, indicating his awareness of archetypal imagery in childhood. It may have struck you that I'm taking a certain amount of poetic license, not to say liberties, with Jung's essay in moving from his reflections on the importance of certain imagery in adults to the instinctual mental life of children as we are thinking about it at the end of the century. But I hope you will consider, as I talk about it, that the instinctual life of infancy and childhood affects our adult mental life to, agree, to a degree which can be acknowledged and to some extent realized, perhaps, by analytical endeavor, but which cannot be overestimated. Importantly, the clinical implications of the existence of archetypal imagery in childhood, of which Jung was aware, an awareness, by the way, for which he acknowledges some debt to Michael Fordham in this essay that Jung wrote, The Child Archetype, the clinical implications of the existence were at this time being extensively and intensively investigated by analysts who were working with children and Michael Fordham, who was alone amongst the Jungians, in, uh, Michael Fordham was alone amongst the Jungians in insisting that the analysis of childhood and infancy was possible, let alone vital. One psychoanalyst, Paula Hyman, described unconscious in infantile fantasy life in terms identical with Jung's definition of archetypal imagery. In one of his frequent anthropological comparisons, Jung stated, quotes, that myths for which we could substitute, this is outside quotations, my parenthetical expression, for which we could substitute these other terms, archetypal imagery and unconscious infantile fantasy. Jung said, myths are the psychic life of the primitive tribe. Today, we attend to the mental myths of our patients in order to be in a position to follow the patterns of their psychic life. If we want to understand something of the meaning of these myths in the individual's mentality, we attend carefully to their manifestations within the I-Thou relationship as it exists in the highly controlled analytic environment. We make use of our own responses within ourselves to any given patient as well as the responses of the patient himself. In this way, infantile and childhood patterns of mental organization, as they continue to influence inner and outer life, lend themselves to analytic investigation. This process, which can be on the one hand considered reductive analysis, that is, the breaking down of complex patterns into their simpler components, can on the other hand constitute what has been called a synthetic process through which, through which the individual can develop and mature. This is what Jung termed the process of individuation. At the very center of the process, is the deep emotional, that is to say, comprising both poles of the archetype, the spiritual and the physical, meaning to the patient of his experience. An unconscious core of meaning, as Jung put it. The heart of the matter is the meaning, as Meltzer puts it. In his essay, The Child Archetype, Jung repeatedly enjoins us to establish a meaningful connection with our child parts. He sees this as being crucial to not only the, ch the life of the individual, but to the life of mankind, in his words. If we lose our roots, the link with the original condition, in his words, may be broken, he says, referring to what Jung calls pre-conscious life in the sense of prior to the development of consciousness. That is, as distinct from Freud's use of the term pre-conscious. He also emphasizes repeatedly that the child motif, which he likens to instincts, exists in us now, not in the past. 
An example of this, which we know to be a central aspect of unconscious inner life, is infantile sexuality in its manifold, personal, and universal aspects. Jung puts the case that the child motif is a compensatory and corrective system which balances the extravagances of the conscious mind or the differentiated consciousness of civilized man, which is, quotes, an effective instrument for the practical realization of its contents through the dynamics of the will. That is, he's, he's talking about the differentiated consciousness of civilized man is the effective instrument for the realization through the dynamics of the will. Um, in other words, the unconscious child parts, especially those identified with dependence and with limitations, when not split off from the personality, but sufficiently integrated into mental family life, can compensate for the fantasy we adults, like children, can have of omniscience and omnipotence that we now know to exist commonly in infantile life, but with which we can pathologically identify ourselves as adults. Jung is thus, uh, uh, and uh, remember that Jung was writing this in 1940, uh, and he does make one or two odd references in the paper to the uh, Nazi phenomenon in very concealed terms. Jung is thus talking about the conflict which no doubt forms a part of all analysis of infantile life between the loving and loyal relation to a set of internal parents, i.e., as Jung puts it, to keep faith with law and tradition, versus the tendency to want to defy, usurp, or triumph over what we need and depend on, but cannot in any real sense turn ourselves into. So Jung apprehends the conflict we perhaps see clinically manifest in conditions such as autism and anorexia nervosa, or in the schizophrenic adolescent who murdered his actual parents in order to dispose of them in his internal life. Jung talks about the loyalty to the parents inside in terms of the attitude of Deo Concedente. And he writes in this essay about the omnipotence and the grandiosity of primitive mental life, which we may see as necessary to one stage of development and to another may be a pathological defense which atavistically attempts to correct for the fear of utter helplessness and impotence or fear of destructiveness that may be felt to be all around oneself. Jung wrote about um, uh, wrote of aspects of the child archetype which are seen in such descriptions as a wonder child, a divine child, a child begotten, born, and brought up in quite extraordinary circumstances, not a human child, but a hero, a god, a giant. He sees the child archetype also as something which unites the opposites, a mediator, a bringer of healing, and one who makes whole or even wholeness itself. It is symbolically represented in myriad ways, including roundness and the quaternity. These symbols of wholeness, Jung says, often appear at the beginning of the individuation process in the first dreams of early infancy, although I wondered how Jung knew those. <clears throat> This mystery is, however, uh, this mystery, however, is consistent with Fordham's formulation of an integrated self that begins to differentiate at a very early stage in life, sometime between conception and birth. I would say uh, it is all, uh, or uh, as Fordham called it, to deintegrate. Uh, it, it is also in harmony with the formulation of a distinguished uh, post-Kleinian Meltzer that the wholeness of the individual and his experience of the whole pre-exists his experience of parts and the experience of the mother or the breast of the outside and the inside in its complexity, its ambiguity, its enigma, if you will, gives rise to an aesthetic conflict at the outset of life which is terribly painful for the infant as Jungians we might call it, the conflict over the experiencing of the numinous. I shall, I, I shall mention a number of the aspects of the child archetype that Jung talks about 
as I think it would evoke a feeling for some of the magic, perhaps the incongruity, certainly the extremity of early mental and emotional life. The prophet, the firstborn of a new generation, appearing in the unlikeliest places, sprung from a stone, a tree, a furrow, water, etc., and in, it, <coughs> and in ambiguous form, Tom Thumb, a dwarf, an elf, personification of the hidden forces of nature, an animal. The Christ child in the legend of St. Christopher is both smaller than small and bigger than big. In the Middle Ages, the child was often a vision spontaneously experienced by mystics, a naked boy, a radiant boy, an unholy boy, an eternal youth, Buddha, and so forth. Jung also alluded cryptically to Hitler youth. He mentions, furthermore, the appearance of figures in the mentally disturbed, imaginary children, homunculi for Schreber, and, most importantly for Jung, as a manifestation of the maturational process that he termed individuation. Crocodiles, dragons, serpents, monkeys, a child appearing in the cup of a flower, a golden egg, or as the center of a mandala, in dreams as the dreamer's son or daughter, or as a boy, a youth, a young girl, surrounded by stars, as the king's son or the witch's child with demonic features. All these young mentions as manifestations of the child archetype. Uh, <clears throat> themes and qualities he describes include a fear of abandonment, vulnerability, invincibility, hermaphroditism, bisexuality, <clears throat> and themes pertaining to the beginning and the end of things. It is noteworthy that many, if not all of these, appear in the drawings, the play, the associations of children in therapy. Thus it may indeed be said that they have a role in the individuation process as it takes place in the analytic setting. <clears throat> It does not perhaps need restating that there is so much evidence of deep and complex mental life from earliest infancy onward, as it is today taken for granted. So much so that we are surprised to think that Jung and his early followers did not take this into account, despite Jung's 1909 essay, Psychic Conflicts in a Child, concerning the sexual fantasy life of his three-year-old daughter. In that paper, However, Jung showed that he was more interested in the capacity for concept building and, th uh, and thought than in the inner life of the child. Later on, uh, some of Jung's followers, such as Francis Wicks and Roland Cahen, acknowledged the archetypal content of children's minds, but they considered that therapy with children was much too dangerous, that archetypal forces, the very ones from which children needed protection, would be unleashed and go haywire. In any event, if children showed signs of psychological conflict, it was firmly held that they had taken their parents' conflicts inside themselves, and therefore the parents were the ones who required treatment. Times change. In our training in child analysis at the SAP, in common with uh, the three other child analytical trainings in London, and with most of the adult analytic and psychotherapy trainings, we require a two-year study of an infant in the home setting, which the student visits weekly for a set period of time. The observer then presents his findings or her findings in detail in a seminar held weekly. These observations have demonstrated beyond any doubt how different each baby is from any other and how much of a role a baby, even a newborn, plays in directing and determining the relation with his mother. As Fordham described it, some of these observations seem almost, incre almost incredible. Observing uh, mothers and infants, it is, not, it is impossible not to conclude that a baby is able to adapt himself to his mother as she is, as a person. One baby seemed to spare his mother his aggressive attacks on the breast so that they could together develop a beautiful breastfeeding relationship in spite of quite severe maternal psychopathology. Another one was able to give such clear and precise signals to his mother about how to behave with her breast that his mother, following these, could establish a good feeding relation with her baby. 
At the start, she had been very unsure of her capacities as a mother. In Fordham's theory, the baby's innate and characteristic capacities become realized through what he called, as I have said, deintegration, which is the unpacking, as it were, or the dividing up of the original integrated self as the baby proceeds to make a relation to the environment. Reintegration through sleep, for instance, also takes place. In this cyclical activity involving projection, introjection, and identification, the baby's ego and his personality develop along characteristic paths, a function of the interaction of his own innate potentialities with the outside environment and the baby builds up an inner world which has an increasing relation to external reality. However, we are more and more aware that babies and children, perhaps even from some time in utero, are more than the quasi-neurological system Freud depicted when he considered that mental life develops more or less in accordance with the pleasure-pain reality principle, with its emphasis on the discharge of drives, the reducing of tension, causality, the adaptation to the environment, the conflict between the id and the outside world. We see mental life from a very early stage as a place where things happen, a world in which the emotional meaning of relations with another is central, where meaning is experienced and generated by a system that is already highly complex by birth. With its obvious implications for the care and raising of children, for the effects of education, and for the relevance to the analytic process, this difference, this change, cannot be too highly emphasized. This is especially so when we consider that the mind builds itself, so to speak, with each emotional experience lending itself to the development of further emotional experience. Something like nourishment or malnutrition, depending on the capacity and the opportunity for bearing painful truths within emotional experiences or the uh, development of a system for the generating and experiencing of mental lies. In analysis and psychotherapy, we place more and more emphasis on the individual's inner experience, on his or her responsibility for their own life, whilst not wishing to cast doubt on the facts of what may have happened to them. Neonatal researchers have shed much light on early infancy in recent years, although they are the first to point out that such research cannot tell us about the nature of the baby's emotional life, only about his mental capacities. In 1972, an obstetrician, A.W. Liley, wrote a paper called The Fetus as a Personality, in which he described an astonishing array of responses that the fetus is capable of. Further work has been done since then which demonstrates the responses of the prenatal infant to the prenatal environment. Still more research has been done and a number of highly interesting books have been written on neonatal capacities, on neonatal capacities by psychoanalysts and psychologists such as Daniel Stern and Joseph Lichtenberger. Here are some of the findings collated by Lichtenberger in a paper written in 1981. He states at the beginning of his paper that, and I quote, the bulk of evidence derived from neonate research would lend support to those who criticize two proposals of psychoanalytic drive theory. First, the economic view that drive discharges or tension reducing, the pleasure pain principle, is the primary principle orienting infantile life. Second, the genetic dynamic proposal that the infant awakens to the world of objects as a consequence of his need for satisfaction of instinctual drives. So Lichtenberger said, Berg said that the bulk of evidence would lend support to those who criticize the, the, these two proposals. Among the findings Lichtenberg's article mentions are, one, the infant not only feeds, he looks, Two, he has preferences among the vis visual stimuli he sees. Three, the newborn will prolong his alert period when his favorite stimuli are offered. And this, I think, was among the most interesting things that I learned. 
newborns actively st seek stimulation, not rest. Four, putting the infant to the shoulder, an action involving more stimulation than any of the others, vestibular, proprioceptive, and visual. Putting the infant to the shoulder was the most effective in diminishing crying. Five, sleep proves not to be a state of absence of tension, rather a time of intense mental activity with long active REM periods. The young organism is thought to need stimulation for brain development, and prolonged quiescence seems to be an indication of pathological reaction to stress. Babies are not seeking to discharge their tension and go to sleep. Study after study disproves a period of normal autism or primary narcissism and documents a preformed potential for a direct interaction human to human with the mother. Seven, neonates react in a specifically responsive manner to their mother's chattering at them in a definable pre-speech activity. Eight, they react differently to inanimate objects, trying to grasp them, than to animate objects. Nine, the feeding, w uh, and in the case of animate objects, uh, they, as I say, they are highly selective among the visual stimuli. They can pick the mother out from a number of others. They uh, make um, movements that seem to imitate the mother's speech and facial movements. Um, and uh, m many other things uh, which are quite different from their responses to inanimate objects. Nine, the feeding experience appears to have profound importance in the establishment of attachment and importance uh, to motivation, vitality, intentionality, and mastery. Ten, many of the studies indicate an impelling nature present in many of the behaviors, an apparent control that the baby has in the organization of his own world. 11. Newborns have a strong capacity for discrimination of smells, sounds, and select preferred visual stimuli and proffer greeting responses selectively. As early as the second week, they prefer three-dimensional objects to photographs of the same objects. 12. Appreciable hand-ear coordination. 13. Capacity for making time estimates. 14, very early capacity for differentiating, timing, screening, pattern matching, sorting, and discriminating. 15, the neonate and his caretaker are an interactional system with the baby influencing the mother through a range of states and behavior patterns. He is an activator of a dialogue and even moves in precise synchrony with adult speech and copies facial and hand gestures made by adults as a newborn. One study discovered that more than half the observed interactions were initiated by the infant, specifically emotional responses which arouse maternal caretaking responses, for instance, fussiness, which starts at about three weeks, supposedly. Of course, these findings cannot, as I said, tell us about the feelings that babies have. They can only infer what babies might be capable of experiencing. Lichtenberg con concludes his article with a detailed consideration of four general areas of a baby's responses which suggest to him a capacity for a sense of self and for differentiating, differentiating himself from his object. As to a young child's mental life, his unconscious life of fantasy or archetypal imagery, if you will, I can give you a brief but charming example. It is of a little girl of five whom I treated for a very short period before she was to return with her mother to her parents' country of origin when the parents were uh, on the point of separating. She uh, had been referred for a bedwetting problem and more than the expectable sadness in the situation of her parents um, not getting on. And she quickly made a strong and productive relation with me. She drew a nightmare in the first interview, which was of a little girl who was being chased by a monster and who weed herself. Uh, and she said that she dreamed this at night. We talked about her weeing herself, 
and about her having nightmares, which required that she run to her mother and father for comfort in the night. They were apparently still sleeping together at that stage. Subsequently, my patient set up a scene. Uh, this was some weeks later. She set up a scene in which a horse mounted an elephant and a yellow splodge appeared on the elephant's back whilst all the little animals sat around them in a circle watching. When I asked her about it, she said it was a statue. I interpreted that I thought the horse and the elephant were mummy and daddy in her mind when they were making babies and that the other babies wanted to watch. Uh, and I noted the yellow stuff on the back of the elephant. I had considered in my own mind that she was concerned with her parents' intercourse, that her own enuresis had something to do with her concern, perhaps to participate in as well as to attack their intercourse, and, and that she might have been afraid as well that she was doing these things in her fantasies. But I said none of this as she insisted it was a statue. This same scene was re-enacted in every session for a few weeks. When I interpreted again that it looked like mommy and daddy might be making a baby in her mind, she grinned and said it was a statue. On the third occasion, I commented on the statue she had made. And I said that maybe she was wanting to keep us as a statue, to keep us together, so that we could not go away from each other. She was nearing the end of the prearranged short term of therapy with me. She said, no, it's not a statue. I said I wondered what it was then, whereupon she wrote on a piece of paper in her own language, they are making love. I did not need to interpret her wish to attack and her fear of destroying her parents' intercourse as I felt it was by this time self-evident. She seemed rather freer and happier in general and I had learned from her mother that, that the nocturnal wedding had stopped. She had, moreover, been able to attack me through her attacks on my French in which her therapy was conducted. She and I had also been able to talk freely about her fears about her parents and about some of her anxieties regarding her siblings. She also talked to me about the death of her grandmother that had just happened and her concern for her mother. I felt that she was able to make many of the links for herself and indeed sometime after her return to their country I had a telephone call from her mother who told me things were going quite rather well for my little ex-patient and that she seemed to be able to deal with the changes in a less disturbed way than they had feared. One of the striking moments in our time together came in the very last session that she had with me. She had written a message for me which she at first said I was not to read uh, and she wrote with her back to me and which she then decided to reveal. It was to some extent coded so she read it out. It was I like you a lot and I shall be sad when we no longer see one another. It remains for me to return to Jung's essay, as I said I would do. We first heard something of Jung's conceptualization of the archetypal content of the psyche, the child archetype in particular, with its magnificent imagery symbolizing wholeness, symbolizing the beginning and the end of things, grandiosity and uh, omnipotence and omniscience, vulnerability at the other end, Hermaphroditism and bisexuality, linked perhaps with infantile sexual life and its fluidity and polymorphism, and as a factor in making a relation to the object. We got a little whiff of the atmosphere of the archetype and its balancing nature and its upsetting nature, its universality and its profound influence on the unconscious life of the individual, in its capacity as an initiator of relating through deintegration and reintegration or projection, introjection, and identification, and as an initiator of symbolizing through fantasy and thinking on to ethical and spiritual life and aesthetic appreciation. This archetypal basis was thought about by Jung chiefly in the context of adult mental life. Then we heard about the work of Fordham and also the Kleinians in bringing clinical experience of children to bear on the subject attempts at constructing a more realistic picture of childhood that analysts had in the early days, of, then analysts had in the early days of psychoanalysis and analytical psychology. The new picture was to be based on direct and systematic infant observation and experiences of children from toddlers to adolescents in the consulting rooms. Neonatal researchers continue to shed a bright light 
on preconceptions and fantasies about the nature of early mental functioning. We are forced to re-reflect on the archetypal contents of the child in the adult. We are continually reorienting our thinking about early mental states and about the extent to which the individual can have consciousness, will, a direct, even profound influence on his world from the earliest postnatal days. The instinctual forces of sexuality and aggression discovered by Freud to exist from early infancy and dated earlier and earlier by later analysts, refined and expanded into a vast field of metapsychological study, have been suffused with the light of emotional meaning, with a kind of poetry in our present thinking about the mind. The passionate meaning and the meaning of the passions of our experience is to the current way of thinking perhaps the single most important factor in the development of psychological functioning, the strengthening and maturation of the mental and moral apparatus from the starting point of the innate potential of each individual. This is a statement about the meaning of the forces of archetypal life in the infant and child part of the adult, stemming from the archetypal life of the baby. Its capacities for destruction or for creation can know virtually no bounds. From the sadistic torturing and destroying of all of mummy's babies, thence to rule the world from a throne of omnipotence inside her body, to the most sublime achievements of humankind, infantile archetypal life has this power. Future creative life may depend on the realization of the capacity for the newborns in the newborn of the experience of the beauty, the awesomeness, and the wonder of his mother's body and her early care. Consider these lines in this regard, written long before psychoanalysis was dreamt of. Wordsworth, who proclaimed the child is father of the man, wrote in his prelude, book two, blessed be the infant babe, for with my best conjecture I would trace our being's earthly progress. Blessed be the babe, nursed in his mother's arms, who sinks to sleep, rocked on his mother's breast, who with his soul drinks in the feelings of his mother's eye. For him, in one dear presence, there exists a virtue which irradiates and exalts objects through widest intercourse of sense. No outcast he, bewildered and depressed, along his infant veins are interfused the gravitation and the filial bond of nature that connect him with the world? Is there a flower to which he points with hand too weak to gather it? Already love, drawn from love's purest earthly fount for him, hath beautified that flower. Already shades of pity, cast from inward tenderness, do fall around him uh, upon aught that bears unsightly marks of violence or harm. Emphatically, such a being lives, frail creature as he is, helpless as frail, an inmate of this active universe. For feeling has to him imparted power that through the growing faculties of sense doth like an agent of the one great mind create creator and receiver both, working but in alliance with the works which it beholds. Such verily is the first poetic spirit of our human life by uniform control of after years, in most abated or suppressed, in some through every change of growth and of decay, preeminent till death. Thank you.